And uh, notice these areas, they're kind of opposite one another. This would have been water, certainly at the time of Menendez, probably in the 19th century too. And these are, well, there they are just showing the, the actual posts that were based on it. Two very large structures uh, at opposite sides of the, um, the end, the eastern, or excuse me, the western side of this town. And the, the one on the south measured about between six and eight meters. That's about 20 feet. That's double the size of the normal ones. This is what the posts look like for it. One on the north uh, was even bigger. Here you can see the line of posts that were excavated actually in 2011 going around. This is the post in cross section. And, and it was almost 12 meters in diameter and it dated, this one we had dates on to about 8,800. Uh, so there was some significant architectural activity going on there in, in a patterned way here in the Fountain of Youth Park. This, normally the structures are not that big. This is one excavated by Carl Halbert and the St. Augustine Archaeological Association on, at 39 Magnolia. Some of you may remember some coverage of this. There were also some burials, Native American burials in that area. But it uh, is a structure that is also about uh, that, that size. They're quite rare. Now this, uh, you, you can just ignore if you want to. We've just put this map together. It's from the excavations at the Nombre de Dios mission site. This is the, uh, here's Ocean Avenue in the gift shop. And it's hard to tell. I overlaid our excavation map onto Google. It is to scale. And this is the rustic altar and where we have been excavating. Keep your eye kind of on that little configuration. Here, here it is again. And this little green spot right here and this look exactly like these. They're made up of a series of depressions. We're not even sure what they can't properly be called big posts, but they're very up. They're very, um, when you see it in the, in the ground, it's very clear, and when it was done, in, this is doing this on its own. <laughs> uh, in cross section. Sorry. Uh, but it forms an, an interesting pattern when these things are you look at it even more closely, if you draw straight lines, you can connect the features. These posts can be connected in this way. Or if you draw a circle, <laughs> you can connect them in this way. And it's, was, it's approximately the same size. It would be about eight <coughs> meters in diameter, the same size as the ones Halbert has found in the two at the Fountain of Beef Park. We're not sure what this means. It's completely, that we have no model to go on for Tamuqua buildings because no one's ever found a whole village with buildings. But this is something we're working with architects to try and figure out. So that's really not part of the story, but it's the first time we've had it on paper. So back to the park. Um, the black lines, like contra lines, show where all the Native American <coughs> pottery was there. So you can clearly see that it, circles around the center. There's very little Native American pottery in that area, which was clearly a plaza. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the Spaniards used uh, the same area later as a plaza. Uh, again, you know, when you have no model to go by, when you don't know what you're really supposed to find, uh, you just have to keep recording it over the years and eventually hope that, that you'll find an analog or it'll make sense, but we've at many sites found these <coughs> clusters of many, many, many little posts. And no one is sure exactly what they are. There are many activities that Tumukwa did that could account for that. There are barbacoas, <coughs> ball games, pits, all kinds of, of benches and so on. Uh, but it's, a, the, it's clearly a typical feature of the Tumukwa that uh, we need to learn more about. Everybody likes the Chamuqua dogs, um, and, and even Jerry had one. None of ours have musket balls in them. 
uh, uh, but there have been two dogs, and I know Carl Halbert has excavated several more. The dogs at the Fountain of Youth Park uh, were uh, clearly prehistoric. One was this end of the site and another over here, and here's where the, the buildings were. Uh, the first dog, let's see, dog one, the north dog, uh, was buried about AD 800, the same time these, these large structures were occupied. And it was a puppy, uh, but they were both buried with their heads to the north facing west and had a broken toe and the stomach contents were analyzed. And the second dog was about 100 years later on the south, um, uh, and buried in the same position, uh, about 30 to 40 pounds, and it uh, was eating fish. Now these dogs, this is interesting because all over the southeast at this time, people, American Indians, were using dogs, having dogs as work animals. And there are sites in the Carolinas where there are dozens of dogs, and what, they were hooked up apparently to travois-type things, and they would pull loads. And when that happens over a dog's life, it develops a certain kind of vertebral um, malformation. And it's very classic. Uh, uh, Alaskan Huskies have the same kind of vertebral, vertebra. So we checked the dogs here for, for that, but none, neither of them had any evidence that they had been used as work dogs. So they were clearly pets. They weren't uh, disarticulated or eaten or anything. They were folded up and placed in a, a careful pit, which is another nice insight into uh, to move with thought. Food, I'll go quickly through this. As uh, I think Jerry mentioned earlier today, there was not much corn farmed here prehistorically, although we found a little bit of maize, a little bit of corn in the prehistoric deposits, uh, it was very little at all. And this does seem to be something the Spaniards came and, and really pushed um, for the Native Americans, but there were, we have been able to identify some of the plants, beans and cabbage seeds and wild grape, very little cultivated material, interestingly. Uh, Vertebrates, the animals, really they were just like the uh, residents of St. Augustine that we heard about today. Uh, they ate fish. 65% of the meat weight that were, was eaten were fish. And uh, land mammals didn't account for much. There wasn't a lot of deer. There was obviously hunting, but they weren't lucky, uh, at least in the deposits we got. The, um, the deer and, and turtles, and when you consider the size of a deer and the size of a turtle and the meat weight for each one, uh, to have them each contribute the same amount shows that there was a much larger number of turtle, in, there were a lot, many more turtles eating than deer here. This could be sampling error. The fish is really interesting too. All, all of you fishermen here uh, will see this whole range of fish were actually caught and eaten, but they really depended on catfish, sea catfish. That was the main food staple, and it's not true today. Um, catfish and croakers, which will be familiar to a lot of people who fish. The shells were a huge part of the diet, but I only I just put this up because we they had different ways of selecting shells. Some were uh, preferred for the diet. This giant eastern murex was the uh, most uh, sort of common shell in food context. They ate a lot more of those. And uh, oysters were only number three in the amount of food contribution, whereas um, in the Spanish context, oysters and clams were by far the, the major source. So there's a real difference in what the Tamuqua and the Spaniards were, were eating in terms of shellfish. I'm afraid to do this. Um, but, and we found that in the tools at the site, uh, the murex was down here, but whelks and conks were overwhelmingly used. They, they don't even really show up in the food remains. They were just used for making tools that, from what we've seen here. And community feasts all over the Americas in places that had chiefdom societies where there was a need to bring people together to create a sense of esprit corps or uh, obligation. This is everywhere around this time, 
or these communal feasts. And we just recently located evidence for what we think is a communal feast at the Fountain of Youth Park, uh, a pit, this really large pit. It's about a meter and a half across and uh, very deep, filled with, uh, I don't know if Tony's here, but she shoveled literally hundreds of liters of shells out of this one pit and a lot of food, bone, pottery. And it was just, we know it was all deposited at one time because the pieces of broken pottery at the top match the ones at the bottom, so it was just a big oyster and fish feast at about 80,000, right about the time, uh, many of these other things. It wasn't on the plaza where most of the Mississippian feasts that have been reported are. It, it was up on the edge of the site, up here, and here was the central plaza. Lots of uh, projectile points, most of them date to the St. John's period, these Pinellas points. I'm gonna point myself, I think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Donna? That's all right. Um, we'll just jump through these. Uh, these were highly skilled craftspeople as well, and I know the Spaniards appreciated this and adopted some of these. We found items in bone, bone knives and pins and beads, um, stonework, gorgets, stone beads, and these interesting, what archaeologists call Florida coin beads. These are tiny. They're only about a millimeter long, but they are made of silver salvaged from shipwrecks. These probably date between Columbus and Menendez, certainly. Um, but these are found commonly in Florida, Native American sites. They would get silver coins and others and make them into uh, ornaments and, and beads. And of course, pottery we're all familiar with, uh, the St. John's pottery of the, of the local Toluca. But this place, on the coast was, we think, maybe a shell tool production. There have been hundreds of these shell tools. Gouges and picks and cups and hoes and hammers. Uh, so this may have been a specialized area. The most beautiful of them are these cups made from Busican, uh, drinking cups about this big. And uh, they're, they're just very lovely artifacts that we know the Spaniards themselves used. And most of that activity, the tools, are found in a specific area right in here. So there was, again, a, a, a plan and a pattern to both the plan of the village and where things took place. And so there was a, a clear plan, almost an urban plan, um, a, a vibrant craft activity area, a really diverse way of making a living and eating here along the coast and through much of the area the Spaniards um, arrived in on, on the coast. And of course, 1565 was the beginning of the end of that way of life. 